smart as you folks are and as brilliant as you can see the next year, there's no way your company is going to really thrive or succeed unless you really deal with all those people at the other end of that camera, that's the 20,000 folks, close to 20,000 in your company. And so one of the key things is here, they have to understand what happened here, they have to see what you actually have come up with, they have to understand what's coming out of these working groups, and once it gets on your team park, they can actually build off that and really kind of give you the feedback and also evolve the ideas in a way that really makes your company thrive over the long run. So anyhow, we're here both in a practical and a theoretical way uh, to talk today. Now, what I'm going to do, though, is talk about a series of paradigm shifts. You're all tech people. You get paradigm shifts. We've watched several of these series of paradigm shifts in the media, in politics, and now I'm saying it's actually coming to problem solving in the broadest sense of towards more engagement, getting more people actively involved in solving a big challenge. I'm going to go review this, but it's also going to be set up to understand what is happening in large-scale engagement of your whole company and of large organizations up to 20,000 or even more to actually solve things in the way that used to be an elite group of, let's say, just senior managers or executives solving these things. And I do want to remind you, it's obvious at some level, but it is really worth pointing out that the year you just went through and the year you're going into is way bigger than just the tech space, right? way bigger than just your economy here in Europe, global economy. We're really going through uh, I think in the long term, if we look back in uh, 10, 20 years, we're going to be seeing this as one of the more fundamental restructurings the world has gone through. There's a really, really fundamental shift going on here. There's a few times this happens when we face as a kind of world an unprecedented series of challenges, which we are up against now, and also when you see deep structural changes in the fabric of the economy and society. We're in one of those moments now. We're watching a kind of a tectonic technology shift, not just, by the way, in information technology, but we're watching it in biotech now, we're watching it in energy technologies, there's some really fundamental restructurings going out in technology. We're watching this re-knitting of the global economy and really the entire global system. It's, much, it's not just globalization, we're watching incredible global integration that looking back 50 years will be seen as the critical thing that happened around the early part of the 21st century. And ultimately we're watching this whole series of challenges which are almost mind-boggling in their complexity, particularly uh, global climate change, but there's all kinds of them now that are hitting us in the 21st century in a way that we've never really had to deal with before. So the larger sense of what your company's doing is don't lose track of this really meta change that's happening all around you at the same time. So we're looking at a kind of a, a transition in the course of the next 10, 20 years here that truly is moving from a kind of global, much more globalized, integrated kind of world we're definitely in the beginning parts, despite the kind of frustration around Copenhagen. We saw some big moves there. We're really watching fundamental shifts in our energy technologies, which is going to have a lot of implications for technology companies in the IT space. So much of that has to be managed by that. We're watching a, a sustainable shift, which is going to have a lot of pressure on corporations to kind of, in fact, we're watching it here in this Societe's uh, palace here. Beautiful kind of sensibility towards sustainability that's only going to get more and more ratcheted up in the next 10, 20 years as this gets more difficult. And ultimately, we're watching a kind of a shift across the centuries. This is finally the kind of big new invention of 21st century systems. Now, if you get more concrete about that big, pro but that big picture kind of, of what's happening, you essentially have a series of smaller paradigm shifts. And one paradigm shift, which is absolutely comes through loud and clear, is a shift towards greater and greater engagement of more and more people to draw them into these processes. And it happens in several ways. You're watching it very clearly, and I'm going to touch just briefly on it. It has happened in media. All the 20th century medias were broadcast, essentially centralized broadcast systems from newspapers and broadcast television, books, magazines, all of them. They are decimated, and they are being now superseded by an engaged media, a media that actually connects with people that people can invo get involved with. Crystal clear in that thing about that trend being very, very clear. What I also was involved with the last four years is essentially the old way of doing politics, very centralized, top-down way of doing politics, was demolished by essentially a technologically enhanced, decentralized way that engaged way more people in the process of politics. And that was the Obama campaign of which I was involved with. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the facts on that just to kind of remind you how this works at other fields. But the final thing I'm going to end up with is how this is now hitting large-scale problem solving which has applications in a societal way, but also how companies are going to essentially envision their strategies, engage their strategies, and really get everyone in the organization engaged in uh, figuring out 
strategy and where to go. The ultimate way you kind of think about this, it's essentially a struggle between two paradigms, a centralized top-down and a kind of more bottom-up engaged one. And that's still the, the jury is out at how that actually is playing out. But that's one way to kind of think of the ultimate shift. Now, you're a technology company, you kind of get this. But the key thing to remind ourselves as tech people is there's three attributes of information technology that are really driving this engagement situation. That is, it applies to all three of these areas I just mentioned. And let's just review them very quickly. The key thing about applying technology is it allows you to scale. Scale way, 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 way more people into any engagement. Once you crack the new model and once you get that new infrastructure, you can get way more people very, very quickly involved in anything. That's the kind of abstract way to think about it. It's the basic social networking phenomena that we've seen in everything that's happened in all the social media, that if everybody just invites two more people, two more people, two more people, that starts essentially an exponential growth of doubling and doubling and doubling, and those numbers get phenomenally huge to the point where you get Facebook numbers, which I'll mention in a minute here. That dynamic, people outside of tech don't really understand it, but that is the juggernaut behind essentially the absolute proliferation of social media right now. Every iteration is a doubling. The second piece about technology that you're aware of is it allows you, to, and it's partly related to the scale, it allows you to parallel process, do things at the same time, coordinate the same thing or similar things at the same time, which blows you out of the constraints of physical kind of containment. And this is, of course, a server farm, which we went, remember the old days of computing, we thought, well, if you had just one giant supercomputer, one brain of a supercomputer, that would do all the calculations. And someone said, now, wait a minute. What if we took a problem, split it up, distributed it amongst smaller computers, and through lightning-fast telecommunications, reassemble the answers? Much quicker, much more scalable. That's server farms. That's how every Google search goes now. It's essentially a kind of a technical kind of fix for a problem solving that is also now applied in a broader sense. So now we're starting to think, ah, you could take all those questions, all those different challenges I mentioned earlier that the world is facing, and you can start to coordinate and parallel process on these things in ways that you wouldn't, if you had the same brain and the same small group of people, they couldn't possibly deal with the scale and complexity of this thing. Which is, again, thinking ahead, this is something that your company is also going to be about. The other thing, obviously, what it does is it collapses space. And you're watching all the implications for your outsourcing here at India that but it's really a huge shift that essentially blows through all these things, is that physically contained meetings get completely superseded. If you can find a way to connect those two worlds, you've got a powerful, powerful organizational principle. And that's what IT lets you do. So applying those principles, I'm just going to do quickly here, just to give you a little flavor of the media one. And again, I could do a whole talk on this. And in the past, I've actually done this. But if you look, these are the traditional media industries. Every one of those is essentially a 20th century construct. Every one of those is essentially a broadcast in the broadest sense thing, where the professionals at the center created a kind of some content and push it out to passive audiences. Every single one of them, particularly the United States, is decimated right now. It is really, really. Now, it's a little less so at the far end here, because these are actually taking a longer time, higher bandwidth needs actually for the internet. But at the ones that were hit early with the text kind of based ones, newspapers are completely in free fall, going out of business in the United States left and right. Books now are actually reeling. The publishing industry in New York is just reeling. Anyhow, you can go right down the line. And what's happened essentially is every one of these things has just been flattened. Now, why have they been flattened? Because the medium essentially that took advantage of that new infrastructure and engaged people, got them involved, didn't passively treat them as audience, but engaged them as active people involved, all of them have exploded in that exact same time frame. These are the YouTube numbers. In the first year of YouTube, they were getting 100 million video streams a day off their servers. They are now up to way over 200 million video streams a day. That's one group, just YouTube, in the space of a day. That's because people want to engage media. They don't want to just turn on television and watch media. And this is, again, a growth. Facebook, another thing. What is Facebook about? It's about people connecting and engaging their material. If you took the biggest countries in the world, top 10 countries in the world, Facebook is now the third biggest country in the world. 
300 million people. That's because they're adding 700,000 people a day over the summer. That's the size of a giant newspaper that's crashing in the United States, and that's what's going on. And again, I'm just saying this not to just, just to kind of give you a sense of like, this is not theoretical. This is happening. This engagement thing is, is a phenom. And this is the uh, final one is the cell phone phenomena, which is actually quite interesting. You've now got, in the space of 10 years, you have 4 billion people on the planet now have cell phones. And that's why Twitter and all these phone apps are just booming, right? And again, why is it? It's because they're not passively taking it, they're actively going into it. Engagement, engagement, engagement. It's the name of the game in media. It's absolutely unequivocal what's going on there. Politics. And again, it's been a year from, you know, Obama's elected, and he might be having some difficulties with the kind of ancient structures of government, and he even had a little bit of difficulty here at a sub-election in Massachusetts. But actually, it's interesting. What happened in Massachusetts was because these people, the opposition now, the conservatives actually used the exact same approach he did to defeat, essentially, the party, the lumbering party establishment in Massachusetts. But anyhow, let me give you a good sense of how this worked in politics, and again, I'll apply it then to what's happening here today. All politics since broadcast television, which was 1960, really, and, and John F. Kennedy, did three things. And the basic way to think of it is it was central. You raised money from really concentrated people like wealthy people or big companies. You had to control the party establishment, which was the tightly controlled organization from the top, the hierarchy. And ultimately, you had to master broadcast television, the one media that got out to everybody, just cooked the same message out to everybody. Anyone who mastered that best won, period, in the United States. Roughly, it's the same thing happened in Europe and all over the world. Until this last cycle, and the last cycle applied those technologies I just mentioned, information technology, and said, well, if we took technology, we could actually tap into many, many, many more people, engage them to put their own money in little pieces of money. And we could actually not need the party, but we could engage all these outsiders and get them involved as a kind of a outside party in a way. And you know what? We could use this new media, the web, that didn't have to control these very expensive kind of broadcasts. And so, in fact, what you watched in terms of all the different ways this happened Fundraising, and I could go through all the numbers, and, uh, but I'm just going to do a good example of this. Basically, Obama raised twice as much money, roughly, as McCain using these new technologies. Half of it was under $200, all because of that engagement. Got people engaged, I'll throw in my little bit of money, whoosh, overwhelm the old centralized system of going to well off the big, uh, rich, richer people to kind of do it. And again, so what you basically got is in the past, that's what it took to win a US election. It was about 100,000 well-off people. Obama, in the primaries, got 1.5 million people, which was more money than anyone could do. And ultimately, you watched in the election, it was roughly, it wasn't quite that, it was about 4 million people, but he raised more money than anybody. Same thing with organizing. And again, engagement, engagement, engagement. What happened here? The numbers in the United States, the Democratic primaries doubled the people involved in those primaries. And the, Republican, or the Democrats almost doubled what the Republicans were able to turn out. Why? Because they had these new tools that engaged people, made them feel connected to the process, made them get energized, made them get out of their houses, made them come out to vote, all the things. Engagement, engagement, totally superior way to go. And ultimately, it was a group of people, centralized old staffs, essentially the executive committee type way, or getting everybody involved. Boom. Millions of people involved work. And then the final thing I'll just say with the media, and then turn to the problem solving, is these new media numbers. This is just, again, an example of the difference between 120 million views for YouTube views for Barack Obama, and ultimately not very much at all for John McCain. Now, why is this important? Engagement. The top 10 videos on this site, people were watching them for an average of 14 to 15 minutes. Not 30 second ads passively watching on television. 14 minutes they would engage this stuff and really actively take in the messages and understand what's going on and then actively hit another button to get involved, put money in or get sign up for the campaign. Engagement, far superior, blew away the way, old way to do it. So ultimately what politics did in the United States, and I think it's coming, it's kind of essentially a paradigm shift that's gonna be increasingly seen all over, is you're watching essentially through these technologies a way to tap into not just rely on the kind of small groups of wealthy, but many, many other folks. 
not just the centralized party, but all these kind of outsiders, and ultimately, not just television and the web. Now, the reason I'm saying this for you today is just to give you evidence of these last couple shifts, because the next thing I need a little bit of a leap of faith for you in terms of the paradigm shift in problem solving. And this directly applies to what you're doing today. So is that this is a next realm. This is the early stages. What we're watching here is there is a next wave of tools that is going to allow a lot more sophisticated involvement of a lot more people in things from everything from solving strategies of companies to solving policies and ultimate solutions for uh, the whole way countries can even work. And the basic way to think about it is it's kind of similar. I don't think the financing works as much in your context here. It does for social kind of context, which you're going to see the, the financing of these things. But the main thing you're going to watch is there's a shift from what used to be always the core insiders figuring out solutions, whether it was, again, company strategy or ultimately policy for the country, and the, kind of the old way of doing it, physical meetings, and then once you figure out something, get it out through press releases and things like that to essentially a way that you're going to watch, uh, again, the financing a little bit different for you guys, but you're watching, gauging a much larger, and when I say much larger, like tens of thousands of potential people involved, and then ultimately leveraging these new, uh, the, the new uh, tools of the web here. Now, what I've been doing the last 18 months uh, since essentially the Obama the election is I formed a company that actually has been working on a new way to solve big, complex problems fast. And Mikhail was mentioning how it's all about speed right now. The world actually faces these incredibly complex problems like how do you shift to clean energy, how do you deal with climate change. The old ways of figuring this out in a little government task force or something are just completely overwhelmed. You need to engage tens of thousands of experts from all over the world to get anywhere close to solving a problem of that kind of complexity. That's my motivation on this thing. But the actual applications apply to pr private companies as well. Is you've got to basically do two things. You've got to essentially figure out a way to get all the good work that comes together in physical meetings like this and connect it into this online world. And once you get there, you need essentially next generation collaboration. Not the old way of just doing email, occasional kind of things that we did in discussion groups, but the next more sophisticated collaboration. Coming from Silicon Valley, there is an explosion of new work around web collaboration is the general way to think about it. It's kind of like the way social networking was four years ago, where there was a ton of new companies, people generally didn't understand what social networking was, but ultimately had this huge impact that we are very clear about today. This is the same thing that's happening around web, uh, web collaboration. One of the big companies is Google Wave, and the technology folks you may have heard about this kind of Google Wave. Google has put their top team for the last two years on a thing essentially developing a new platform called Google, Google Wave. And essentially it is a collaboration system that allows very nuanced, very sophisticated uh, collaboration. And it's essentially a platform that allows all kinds of these apps, like a, like a, like a, like a kind of Apple iPhone apps, to do little pieces of collaboration. Well, I'm going to figure out a way to do a whiteboard. I'm going to figure out a way to vote. I'm going to figure out a way to do all the little nuanced things you have to do in face-to-face -face communication. Other companies are springing up, though. This is Mark Andreessen, was the Netscape guy, Ning guy. This is the co-founder of Facebook, uh, Facebook. They're starting all these kind of new companies in web collaboration. I'm just kind of saying this, that there is a kind of a next trend of web collaboration that you guys are now in the forefront. Microsoft, IBM, the companies you're aligned with have their own versions of this. And what I'm just saying is there is a new kind of updraft now in web collaboration that's going to happen. And what's going to happen is they have to figure out ways to get all the decisions out of just the few and the small kind of group of consultants and figure out a way that how do you start to get a much larger pool of human resources? All your employees, all your kind of, even ultimately to the public to a lot of different people here. To do that, you have to figure out how do you get everything going on here amongst your 300 top people in the company and get them to actually get all 20,000 people working on it here. You can't have all 20,000 here. You guys can't spend all your time on cyberspace. How do you do that? So the way to do this is video. And this is why there's a new way. I mean, if you notice here, there's all these different cameras. What you have to do is start, because video is cheap, and there's a next kind of generation of, of kind of web savvy video journalist types, you're able to capture much more nuance of what happens, get it onto the web, so that the people on the web can build off what happens in these environments to really do sophisticated, be up to speed. So they're not just ancillary, 
They're not just kind of unrelated to what happens here. They have to know what are you thinking here? What are the leadership thinking? What are your ideas? What's coming out of these working groups? They have to get it. They have to feel it. They have to feel like it's open and connected to it. I get it. I'm there in order for them to do anything significant and to really give you the kind of value you want later on. And so that's what you need is that video. Ultimately, it allows you to kind of link these two worlds. Another good kind of attribute of this next era is showing that you're not just a closed room, you're not just the kind of elite executives, but in fact, you're opening this whole thing to the whole process. Now, what we've done here is we've built it on Google Wave. Video platform is another level. Our platform goes on top of that, but this is your Sojet T one. And so from our point of view, there's a larger way to weave over the future. I think you'll be thinking about this. How do you weave from the offline physical meetings to off online kind of involvement? How do you go back into the offline, back into the online? There's a way to kind of take large, complicated problems and drive through, ultimately, to much more sophisticated solutions. And we're basically saying, through the video here, we're going to package that in a way that actually is easily digestible, many different entertaining, interesting ways that your entire company can then basically understand what's going on there. You really want people to understand fully and engage and want real serious feedback on? This is the way to do it. It's on a platform that allows hundreds of people, thousands of people to scale up problem solving in your company. This is the way you got to go. Think about setting the context for the other people to contribute. Think about not just telling them what you're doing, but engaging them to work on these in the long run. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Pete. That was, that was excellent. That was excellent. Um, we're running a little bit out of time, but, but, but still I want to, to, to ask you a question and, and, and maybe open up from some questions from the audience. We still have a few minutes. Um, th when I was listening to you, the main question I had is that not everybody likes paradigm shifts, right? This, this is not... Usually people don't like change. So, so, so how do you overcome this, this anxiety this, this, and, and, and people actually at changing from the old thinking to the new thinking? What would be the biggest mistake that people can make? Well, here's the thing, and I watch this very closely. One of the reasons I was giving you the background on what happened in the media, I was in the media business. I watched in the early Wired days, we talked about the destruction of what's eventually going to happen to newspapers. And the newspapers had 20% margins at that time, and they were saying, you got to be kidding. This internet's going to basically undermine newspapers. Crazy. And now, in fact, the entire kind of these newspapers are literally in the United States are going out of business on a week. Every week, there's a new business, a new uh, one goes under. Same thing with politics. I was involved deeply in democratic politics. People in Hillary Clinton and all the kind of traditional politicians, they looked at us and said, You got to be kidding. You're using, you know, YouTube videos and MySpace and Facebook and, you know, text messages to win in this thing. And in fact, the only person, the real outsider who had no chance traditionally of winning was Barack Obama. And he said, Oh my God, okay, I'll try that. And clearly it won in the end. And now everybody's kind of adopting the same thing. As crazy as it sounds right now, this is the same thing that's going to happen in this, in this paradigm shift. The companies that stay kind of very elite oriented, and I'm going to just figure it out from the center, I'm going to be the kind of uh, executive committee or even the top managers, we know better than everybody. Not only are you going to lose the best people who are not going to want to play in that game, they're going to want to play in a game that's an engaged company that I have some input into, that, I can, that they respect me, they listen to me, but also they want to be a part of a winning company that's going to win. They don't want to be a part of the... Hillary Clinton campaign that's going to crash, or let alone stick with a newspaper business when Facebook's you know, booming. So it's essentially a kind of a, a shift of partly out of fear, partly out of you, know, you have to say, you know what? This is a shift that is happening whether you like it or not. You could say, well, I'll wait for it to mature a little bit more. I'll wait till maybe it's obvious that everybody's got to scramble for this thing. But that's what's happening to the person running the you know, Los Angeles Times right now is desperately trying to figure out how to catch up. I think where you guys are extremely well positioned is if you take a little, not so much fear-based, but a little bit more foresight-based and see these patterns over and over and over again. When technology gets applied, it allows engagement. People like engagement, whether they're watching media or whether they're working for a company. There's everybody in your company, they don't want to just passively listen to what's the idea, what do I do, and then go do their job. 
They want to actually engage what's the idea, give their idea, even to just to think they're being heard, but particularly to actually, if they got their ideas and heard, and then engaged upon, and actually worked upon, they're energized, they're connected, they're committed. They're not going to get wooed to another company. Uh -huh. They're not going to drift off and say, this is not for me. And so it's the same kind of thing. It's just a kind of a pattern that we've seen over and over and over again. And there is no evidence, zero evidence, that this trend is reversing. If anything, it's only reinforcing itself over and over again. And so I would just say you want to basically, partly out of fear, and say, you know what, we've got to keep with it, but more out of kind of vision. And I think the neat thing about your company, Subject T, which I've actually been really impressed with over the years, is you actually are innovative, and you actually are entrepreneurial, and you do take risks. And I think that's been one of the hallmarks of your company. It's one of the things I've been really the most excited about. And so when Mikhail says, you know, not only just come and talk, but let's bring a crew. We got six people here, video crew. Let's try to actually do this. Let's capture the, what's going on here. Let's get it into Team Park. And just the fact that you have Team Park, most companies your size, and you know, kind of do in your business, they're not genuinely trying to collaborate on strategy right now. They just aren't. This gives you a strategic advantage. It gives you a leg up. And in a tech business, which you're really selling as a tech business, anybody who's seen is on the front end or familiar with the next big thing, that's street cred in tech. That's where people want to go. And so I, one of the things I kind of was just alluding to, the Google thing and this Asana, which nobody knows. Asana just got $9 million in venture capital literally just two months ago. There is a series of companies in this space now because everybody's starting to think, ah, this is the next big way it's going to break out. And the reason it is, is I'll tell you one last thing about this because it's kind of abstract and hard to deal with. Up till now, online collaboration has been very crude, very difficult, very clunky, and very disconnected. You kind of can do one thing or another thing. What's starting to happen is it's getting much more integrated, much more smooth, much better user interfaces, and much more sophisticated, so you can get much more nuanced interaction online that's much more similar to the nuanced kind of interaction that you get in face-to-face. -face. So just think, there's a next generation. It's just starting. You're part of the forefront. The more you do it now, the more you're going to save in the end. OK. Well. Are there any questions at this moment from the audience? Just one there in the middle. Somebody is running towards you. What do you think of the idea then of extending Team Park to our clients and to outside talent? Do you think that's a risk of exposing our IP and intimacy, or would that be something you'd recommend? Good question. Right? I would say that is the next where it's going. I would say it's risky for a corp corporation right now uh, to actually get that far out right now? Because I, if I hear you right, here's what I would say, is you're still talking about, you want to be talking about serious strategy. You really want people to openly talk about your vulnerabilities as well as your, um, uh, you know, your strengths. Uh, and to do that, you need to have a safe environment that you really feel this is a conversation that's you know, bounded by your company. And I think that's totally right. And I think in the ultimately, that's the way to get everyone over the hump and feel confident about using this thing. That said, what you're saying is the ultimate next step for all of this. And what's really interesting is that some really established companies are doing, like PG&E, for example. PG&E, essentially, its R&D is now done more. They, they have an R&D department, but they essentially are now exposing all their R&D ideas and engaging a community of outside developers and even their clients to actually help them figure out the next products that they're going to be lining up there. And they're finding it's fantastic. It's accelerated the amount of products that they've now come up with. It's engaging this huge community of people that wants to actually work with them now. And it's been a huge hit for those guys. There was some vulnerability of exposing that kind of long-term thinking. But in fact, it really worked very powerfully. Google's doing the same thing. Google, in fact, with this Google Wave situation, they're essentially allowing a community of developers, and actually my company is one of them, complete access to this thing. They're saying, here it is, rough and it's, here's our plans, here's what we're trying to do, give us feedback, figure it out. And it's just amazing how, how basically people will respond to that. And so they're finding it very successful to engage potential customers and also potential competitors even to give them a kind of little insight. Riskier, but clearly where the trend is going. And I would say after a time, you might consider that as well. I think in your business, getting at least your customers engaged in this, maybe not 
totally exposed to the public and your, your competitors. But uh, the earlier you get your customers involved, the better, because they'll, they'll give you better than anybody. At, but at this stage, at least get the 20,000 people on the front line who are talking to those customers actively involved in this process. And that's what you're doing. I think it's a totally great first step. OK. Well, I think there, there, there must be more questions, but Pete will be here the rest of the day. So what I would suggest for timing is that we uh, uh, thank Pete now with another big applause. Thank you very much, Pete.